Okay, well, I guess I'll, uh, I'll get started. Um, thanks for showing up. I know it's uh, late on Friday and everyone's a little bit burnt out after a long week, but uh, I appreciate it. Um, a couple of questions for us. How many people are actually running OpenStack? Like, have it in production? Okay, good. And monitoring? You're monitoring your system? Yeah? Um, some tools. Um, Nagios. Okay, pretty popular. Uh, Xenos, okay. Uh, StatsD, Graphite, a little bit. Yeah, Logstash, Riemann. All right, so you've got a full open source monitoring stack going. Good. Um, how many people are running StackTac? Okay, oh, good, awesome. Uh, how many people are running Solometer? Okay, a few more, good. Um, and how many people are doing billing? against OpenStack, okay. Couple, all right, good, all right. So the purpose of this talk uh, is to talk a little bit about StackTac, which is, a, uh, it started off as a monitoring tool that we developed within Rackspace. My name is Sandy Walsh, by the way. I'm a developer with Rackspace. And uh, to talk a little bit about the Solometer project and how we are hoping to take the functionality of StackTac and move it over into Solometer. So just as a bit of background, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on, on StackTac first, and then we'll talk about Solometer, and then we'll talk about the steps that we're, we've been taking to, to merge the two. So StackTac was in, introduced around Diablo, which was uh, a long time ago, and it came from a point of pain that we had uh, when I was working on the, on the Nova team, uh, trying to debug OpenStack, uh, pouring through all the log files, and uh, was just very problematic. So one of the things that we had within Nova was the ability to emit messages or events uh, out of the system. So uh, if, you want, if you want StackTac, you can go to this URL and you can download it and use it. And it, and, uh, it started off, like I say, as a tool for monitoring and debugging uh, OpenStack. And the way it worked is these different systems will, as things happen, important events that happen inside the system, they'll emit these notifications or events onto the, uh, into the queuing bus, and then other systems can take it and consume those events. So StackTac has a couple of components. There's a database where it stores all those events. There's a, uh, a web application that runs. That's the actual StackTac application. And then there's a worker, and the worker is, is this little service that goes out and pulls the events off of the queuing system and uh, s sticks them in the database. And it gives you a nice, pretty little web interface on it. And you can see in real time all these events that are coming through. And you can, everything on there is clickable. So if I see a tenant ID, I can click on that and see all the actions by that tenant. If I click on a request ID, I can see everything for that request, um, a, a particular event name, a host name. So it gives you a lot of sort of, uh, I don't really know what I'm looking for, but I'm going to find through here. And you can explore and look into all the gory details of, of the event. And there's a REST interface, so if you want to query it and get those events out, you don't have to get into all the gory details of dealing with a queuing system or anything. You can just hit it with a REST interface and pull out some of the events. Operations people aren't big fans of GUI interfaces, uh, so there is also a command line tool that you can basically get all the same operations from there. Uh, I was going to do a demo of StackTac and Stacky and stuff, but there is a video available uh, online, so you can just do that. It'll show you how to install it and, and how to get it going. But the real value of, of looking at these events is that you get very rich information um, about how the system is changing, so state transitions that are happening inside, um, inside of OpenStack. So this, this is a create instance operation. And we can see that the request comes in to the API, and we get an event called compute instance update. And then it'll go through the scheduler, and there'll be a bunch of decisions made about where are we going to stick this instance. Um, and then we get into the actual compute node, where we send an update, where we go to the building state after it's been scheduling. We start it. There's a bunch of updates that go through as we provision up the networking and as we set up the block devices and we do all these other operations. And then at the end, we'll get a create end event. So now we have the ability to look at a, on a per request basis of what's happening in the system, as opposed to just the spew of logs that come out. These are, are related here. So 
that was a great debugging tool, but once we saw what we had there, we realized that we can also start tracking performance. And my mandate at the time was monitor everything, right? Measure everything in the system and see what's going on, because we wanted to get faster performance of the system. So StackTac, since it had all that information, turned into that tool. And we were able to get some really cool reports out of this. So you can look at build time per flavor by region. Um, the AMQP in-flight message latency, because we know when the events are leaving one system and going into the other one, we can find out how long they're sitting in the queue and find out where things are hanging up there. So the um, you know, failure rate by tenant, uh, migration sizes by image type, really rich information that to get that out of a log would be very, very um, difficult. So like I say, it was monitoring on a per request basis. Every time a request comes in to OpenStack, it's tagged immediately with a request ID. And we can use that to correlate all the actions inside the system. Now, that's right, across all the different nodes. Um, so uh, now we were doing monitoring as well. We have StatsD installed at Rackspace. We have Graphite installed. We've got Nagios. We've got you know, all these tools all over the place. But they weren't able to give us this level of detail. You know, tools like that are great for any system. You know, and I strongly recommend them. But to get into the heart of the system, of the application that's running, you really had to look at the events. And so what we were seeing there was you, you have events on one side, which are these very rich objects, and then you have samples on the other, other side. And uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit between the difference here. So samples are small, you get a lot of them, and they're pretty disposable. It's not mission critical. So uh, an example of a, a sample would be CPUs at 70%, right? Measure that every 30 seconds or so, get a nice graph come out. You get a picture of what's happening in your system, but you're not knowing why things are happening. So um, samples sort of give you, like I say, samples give, give you the what and the when of what's going on in your system. Uh, events, however, are very rich. They give you, it's a big payload. You, you know, it, there's a cost associated with sending it out because it is big and, and you gotta be careful how many you send out because it can clog up your system. But gives you everything that you need. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why. Why did the scheduler make this decision? Why is the host taking so long? Why, um, why did it send the request to this node for networking? You know, all that detail. If we compare CPU at 70%, to an event like this, you can see the, the difference here. I've got all the context that I need around the decisions that are being made. What's the tenant ID? What's the reservation ID? Uh, tell me all about how many VPUs are going into this instance. Very rich data. Um, so for what we were trying to do for performance measuring and monitoring, we were finding that uh, events were giving us better results than the samples we're getting. Samples were great if we wanted to find out how many 500s on, on we were getting per hour on the front end uh, APIs, but to find out why we were getting those 500s on the front end APIs, we needed to dig deeper. So we worked with that for a while. That was really cool. And we get, then we realized, okay, now these events are giving us a lot more information than what we initially thought after we had used for all the, all the performance uh, enhancements. What we were seeing that uh, for billing operations, we could use these events to make sure that the customer wasn't being overcharged or undercharged. And we could do this in a way that we could uh, do some double entry accounting on the operations that were happening inside the system. So I'll just show you some of the events that, that we were seeing here. Uh, whenever an instance was being created, the start and the end fence posts around those operations. Rebuilds, resize, rescues, deletes. All of these are, are billable events that happen inside the system, and these are the things that we wanted to be able to track, as opposed to just looking at the production database at the end of the day. The thing we didn't want to do was to have other groups coming in and accessing our production database. We didn't want to have to get into database replication and all these other things against the production database. A lot of sensitive data in there, we don't want people using it. The events were able to give us all that information. Another very important one is this one at the end here, compute instance exists. And the exists event is generated um, within Nova whenever the launched ask date changes on an instance. So the launch at date is when the instance is created, when there's a resize happens, when there's a rebuild, that date changes and, and that's the one that triggers how much are we gonna bill for. 
So whenever there's a state change on that field, you get an exist record. And if the instance has just been running all day and nothing's really changed, no one did a snapshot, no one did anything fancy with it, you'll get them at the end of the day. So if you've got 100,000 instances, you'll get 100,000 of these exist records at the end of the day saying, here's the instance, it's alive, you can use it, um, you can build for it, and here's what the bandwidth was throughout the day. Bandwidth is a, is a complicated one that people want to track, so uh, that all comes up in the exist record. And so it's, it's, a, it's a juicy little nugget to, to tap into. So all these operations, these rebuilds, these resizes, all these billable events were, um, and then the, at the end of the audit period for us every day, uh, we were getting all that information out of it. The problem we had, though, was how would you know if an exist record got dropped? So now, um, do we bill for that? Because if we don't see an exist record, then probably means the instance isn't around anymore. But an event can get dropped. So. The first thing that we had to do was, in order to use this for billing validation, we had to make sure that events were first-class citizens, that we couldn't drop those events. It's different than a sample. It's, a not, it's not a disposable thing that we can send across UDP. The event was something that we got into the queuing system, and then we locked down on it, we make sure that it's a very careful handoff from this system to that system. So our focus for Havana in StackTac was to make sure that we had reliable, audited, and reconcilable event collection. And we did that um, a couple of different ways. So we had our worker, which was collecting all these events out of the queuing system, and we were doing all these, we had these other database tables in here for things like performance tracking and all the rest of it. So we could look at um, start end times on a per request basis, and that was in, stored in a separate table inside the database. The life cycle of every operation, so a create end operation, we had that in a different table, we could look at that. So what we started to do was to create um, tables for the individu individual usages, the delete operations, and all those exist records that showed up at the end of the day. And so now what we had was a system where we could actually do some checks against it. So we have a tool called the validator, which goes out. Um, if the end of the day is at midnight, then we can wait a couple hours in case there's any latent events that are happening inside the system. And we can look at the updates in the deletes table and find out what the world should look like from these incremental events that would happen, and then compare that to the end of the day events, and then we could find out if we dropped an event, or if something went missing, or, or whatever. And then we could take that, and if we did have a discrepancy, there's another tool to call the reconciler that can go out and, if, if you give access to the production database, it can go out and check what production says, and actually reconcile this and say, I think it's there, but I'm not really sure, and then you can look at production and say, well, production says it's there, so we're gonna bill for it. Um, that's an optional piece. You can run that if you want, or, or you can just turn it off. And what will happen at the end of it is we'll emit a new event into the system. So now StackTac will e emit a, uh, an event into the system that we can use an exist.verified record. And that says, we've done all the checks, everything looks good, or there's an error. Um, and we got some really valuable information from that. We were able to check things like, did we get instance type mismatches? D did the tenant ID change? That's a very significant one. That's probably some sort of security breach or something, or someone just entered something wrong, or, or a customer took over or something. Um, some internal rack space specific options, things that are pertinent to our business that we could check as well. Um, if the architecture changed, if, you know, so if someone changes the flavor size and it, it doesn't match with what we're billing against. So all these things that we could check, the, the image size, obviously image storage is the thing that we want to bill for. So we can check all these things at the end of the day and get a very rich sense of are we, are we measuring the right thing. So then StackTac then can be used to push all that stuff downstream into our billing systems. And that's another important place where that handoff, because these are still events, we want to make sure that those handoffs are very carefully you know, managed and they show up on a silver platter. So what we did was um, we actually publish our events into two different queues. So we publish into one called the notifications queue, and then we have another one called the monitor queue. And StackTac will uh, consume from the monitor queue, and then we have, an there's another couple of open source projects, and you can, you can get these on GitHub. Uh, Yagi is a tool that uh, will just bulk consume from a queuing system. So it'll just grab all events it can and relay them onto somewhere else. So if you want to push them to another system, you can do that. And that's, that's what we use. We use Yagi to consume from that queue and then pass them on to Atom Hopper, which is a pub subsystem. So now we take all those events and we turn them into RSS and Atom feeds so that other systems downstream can consume them. And when Yagi hands it off to Atom Hopper and gets back a, 
a 200 response, then we can call back into StackTech and say, yep, we got it, we passed it on downstream, everything's cool. So now we can mark that record as verified. So now later we can, we can see if there's any problems here. But the mission was get it out of production as quickly as possible, store it, and then do the analysis on it. We, did, we would, wanted to make sure that if something failed, uh, we didn't drop anything. So these are the, some, some of the reports. These go out every day. Senior management gets them. Everyone gets to see these reports. Um, so we want to find out you know, how many instantaneous events came through throughout the day. You know, thousands and thousands of these uh, verified uh, events that are happening. And these are the error codes that are coming back as they're getting handed off to Adam Hopper and the downstream systems. And if something doesn't match in the verification, we get a report here that says the instance type doesn't, you know, we thought the instance type was going to be a six and we got a seven. Something's up here. Now we can give that to the reconciler and let it try and validate it automatically, but we turn off the reconciler. We want people to manually check that stuff and ensure that everything is, uh, you know, why is it a six and not a seven? And then we can generate all these, uh, you know, graphs and reports our bandwidth changes, um, the exist.verified records as they get handed down to the system, as they go to Adam Hopper and the other downstream systems, uh, and even the downstream systems from that. We have a, a, an internal group called a usage mediation system, and, or uh, a system call that, and we can hand it off downstream as well, so we can see if there's any drops even down to those systems as well. So the interesting thing about this now is we're generating samples from the events. So th that's a very important thing to, to consider is that as we start working on these events and we start getting valuable information out of it, they produce samples that again go into the system and become part of the monitoring system as well. So we can get the historical trends. So that's StackTac in a nutshell. That's, that, the, that's the, the mission that we, we had with it. So let's talk a little bit about Solometer. So, uh, People familiar with what a solometer is? I, I didn't know what a solometer was. A solometer is a device for measuring the height of a cloud. It's a laser they shoot up and find out where, it's a clever name. Between that and Cinder, I don't know which is a better name. Cinder is for block storage, Cinder block. I don't know. Solometer is pretty cool for that too. So anyway. <laughs> um, so solometer was proposed around the Folsom time frame a little bit later, and it started off, uh, the first mandate was as a billing solution. So at the time, we were thinking about performance and, and uh, those other sorts of enhancements. So we weren't really thinking about billing at the time, especially in the stack tech world, so we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Um, around Grizzly, the mission changed to be a monitoring solution. So our ears perked up and we said, okay, this is something we have to keep an eye on. Um, around that time, that's when uh, the foundation created the incubation process and Slometer was incubated around Grizzly Havana timeframe. And when StackTac was started, we didn't have any concept of incubation or anything. It was just an external project that you know, fed off of the uh, OpenStack system. So uh, around the start of Havana, we made the announcement on the mailing list that we were going to port StackTac over to Solometer, and which was great for us because we grew very organically and, and there were things that we wanted to change in the design that we didn't quite get right. Uh, you know, we solved a lot of problems, but there's things we could do better. Some of the problems we had, we had a limitation of only having one worker being able to consume from the queues because we're dealing with temporal data here. And if we started pulling in these events from multiple readers, then they could get out of sync and then we could see a dot end coming in before a dot start and then that would fool us up. Um, there was no item potency in the processing pipeline. If the worker went down, uh, we would probably lose what our pipeline looked like and that could be fatal. The database migrations were horrific. I mean, this is a lot of data, and we have to store 90 or 180 days of, of this data before we can archive it. Um, so whenever product management would come around and say, hey, you know what, wouldn't it be really cool if we could check this? Let's do something that does image type against region. And we would go, oh, okay, and we need to update the database table and everything. This database is really big. Um, so the migrations were just taking a, a really long time. So we wanted to find a better schema and a better system we could use for, for recording this stuff. We also record the entire event, the whole JSON blob, the, the whole event blob that we get. We store the whole thing in, in the database. So if someone gets an idea down the road, even though we're not using those fields, we can go, yeah, you know what, we've got 180 days worth of data. Let's go back and do an analysis and find out. We don't have to wait you know, for another 90 days before we can find out if we're getting meaningful data from it. So 
that's really cool in theory, but in practice when you had to go back and grab a big JSON blob out of a database and decode it and then look at it and then throw it away and grab another one, that's really time consuming. So when we were backfilling some of our databases, these operations were taking you know, like an entire day just to backfill for a week of data, and that just wasn't feasible. So we had to find a better way to do that. Also, also our batch window was getting tighter and tighter. We're running some big reports against the database, and we, you know, we start them at, let's say, one o'clock in the morning. We've got to have them ready for eight o'clock in the morning, and this thing is crunching a lot of, a lot of data, so um, we wanted to make sure we get them in a timely fashion, and we could see that the way we were going, this wasn't going to scale out as well as we want. And we're, we run Stack Tech in production against all of our regions in all of our cells, um, and we, we gather a lot of data from it. So we want to find a better way to do that. Uh, and then all the massaging of the events. These events come in, and we had a lot of stuff in code that said, okay, this is a dot .create event. Let's pull out these fields. And this is a dot .end event. Let's pull out these fields. And there had to be a better way to do it. We wanted to make it, have it more data-driven and not repeat our definitions of the events across different systems. And we didn't use Oslo. Oslo is the common library, if, if you're a developer, Os Oslo is the common library used by a, a lot of the different OpenStack projects. And we wanted to be able to make use of that so we were a, a, a better behaved citizen. So yeah, we had, we had some, some things we wanted to change. The problem, though, that we had is Solometer is sample-based. So Solometer thinks of problems like CPUs at 70%, and it didn't have this concept of what an event was and, and how rich that data is and how can we query that very efficiently. So, um, so it, it's, a, it's a big change, and it's a different way of thinking. Fortunately, the Solometer team was very cool with you know, being receptive to it, and yeah, let's, let's figure out how we can make this work. So we did get some good stuff done in Havana. Not as much as we wanted, but we did make a lot of progress. Um, a lot of the work that we did was back in the uh, Oslo and at the RPC notification layer. So we added a bunch of stuff in there for acknowledgement and requeue semantics on the queuing system. So now if an event came through and something failed, we could push it back into the queue and we wouldn't drop those events. That's all in OpenStack uh, Oslo now. Things about how we store those events. We've been working on a lot of different uh, schemas for how to store that in a SQL-based database and in a NoSQL-based database. Uh, so we, we've been messing around with that. So we keep our events, like the trimmed down version of the event, the event that we, the pieces of it that we really need uh, in a separate uh, table that we can access very quickly and we can, you know, very highly index and, and we can access it uh, without all the pains that we used to have in StackTac. But then also we have a different mechanism for how we store the entire message body. We don't have a JSON blob anymore. We have that something that we can when the time comes and someone says, hey, what if we did image type, then we can actually go through and just grab all the instance types very quickly, or the image types, and just see how that works. So a lot of these are branches that are still in the pipeline. We're trying to get them uh, approved, but the code is all there. Millisecond timing resolution on the storage systems, the Solometer had uh, second base data, and we obviously need to hire. The, Translation of the notification into a, an event is all data-driven now, so anyone can do it just by changing a YAML file. I'll get, I'll get into that a little bit more in a second. And then we have this entire system called a trigger pipeline for tracking all these events as they come through and creating a pipeline of ordered events that are related. So we didn't have to do these fancy database queries at the end, and I'll give you some examples of that. So if you've used Riemann, I think there was a talk earlier about Riemann I.O. and how you can use that for monitoring. Riemann's a really cool tool and we modeled this basically on Riemann, but it solves a lot of the problems that we had with looking at Riemann um, about how do, you, how do you share it across multiple nodes? How do you have a stream that can exist in multiple places? Uh, Riemann's all, yeah, um, Riemann is all in memory, so if the system went down, you'd lose a stream, so we wanted to make it persistent, and so, so a lot of goodies in there. So that's what we got done in Havana, and in Icehouse, we want to finish the job. We want to get all the stack tech functionality over so we can start to twilight one and bring on the other one. So the place it starts is with that mapping of the notification into the event. Uh, remember I showed you that event earlier. This is a, you know, a big monster, several K long uh, chunk of data that comes in. We don't need all that stuff. We just need like the stuff in yellow. So we might need instance type or the state and the tenant ID. And we wanted a way that we can pull that stuff out without having to change code every time. So one of the pieces that was added is this grammar. It's, it's YAML-based 
where we can say things like, when the event type comes in that has a start of uh, compute.instance.whatever, then pull out all these traits. And the way we store an event now, instead of one big denormalized table, we have events and traits. So a trait is like a key value pair related to the event. And now programmatically, or you know, th through a configuration file, we can define what are the fields that we want to pull out of it. And you can even have plugins in there if there's some fancy fields or a bit-coded field that you need to get and stuff. You can add code to it as well. And then it also supports things like inheritance. So down below, we have uh, some very special event types that look like the other ones. And you can see it, it sort of inherits everything from the instance traits up above. But for an instance exists or an instance update, we also have these other fields, audit, uh, audit period beginning, audit period ending, that we want to retrieve as well. We don't have to copy paste everything and, and duplicate it. So it's a, it's a nice rich grammar that uh, we should be able to define all, of, all the events in the system. Not just for Nova, we want to do it for you know, Cinder, we want to do it for Quantum or uh, Neutron, I'm sorry, um, and all the other systems as well. So, so now we've got an event. We've got something that's highly indexed, highly available in the database and persisted. Uh, so we want to hand that off to that routing system, that, that industrial strength Riemann processor that I talked about briefly. So the, the event manager, as the collector is pulling in these events, what we would call a worker in stack tech, uh, Solometer calls a, a collector, then the event manager will look at it and it'll pull out the fields that it thinks are important and it can create these uh, sort of virtual collections of events and it can do that across multiple collectors uh, in, in a consistent fashion. So we can do things like, let's create a pipeline for every unique request ID that comes in. So now as soon as it hits the API to the last dot end event that we get, we'll just have one sequence of events that are all related. So now I don't have to go back to the database and run these fancy queries, I just, here it is, and it hands it off to us and it's ready to go. Uh, if I wanted to look at a particular instance ID, if I want to have a, a different stream for every inst instance ID in the system that went through, if I wanted to look at all the, the, the related events on a particular server or by a different tenant, I can set up these things and have it watch them and create these streams for me. Um, so that's very powerful. And the way we do that, again, is another YAML grammar. So we can, this, this would be a very simple one. This is grab all unique requests. And it says, OK, let's match everything and distinguish them by the request ID and expire it an hour after the last event that we've seen. So a request ID will come in, gets tagged on at the API, and it goes all the way through. And we don't really know what the last event is. It could be a resize operation. It could be a delete. Rather than have to hard code all those things, if, if, if you did hard code them, it would be great, because then you wouldn't have to wait an hour. Uh, and you could just trigger the pipeline right away. But if you don't really know, you can make something generic like that and say, well, you know what? I haven't seen anything in an hour. That's probably the end of it. Let's see what's in there. And then the, this will get passed off for processing. Or you can get fancy. You can do something like this. Like this, this one here w is for tracking all the exist records that come in at the end of the day. So what we'll do here is we'll match all the compute instance events that f have a timestamp within the begin uh, beginning of day and end of day from the from the first event, uh, beginning of day to end of day, and we'll also look for the exist records that have an audit period field in this range. We'll distinguish it by instance ID. So now we're going to get a pipeline for all related instance IDs within that range. We're going to delay it by about an hour. So just in case there's some jitter in the system, let's say a collector is slow and the events are coming in out of order, we can wait for a little bit and have them reorder automatically across all the different collectors. Uh, the firing criteria for it is when we see that exist record come in. So once that happens, we're going to, we're going to tentatively trigger, and then we're going to wait about an hour just to settle it out, and then we're going to fire it off. And if there's something else related to it, we can go back and we can also pull in events from elsewhere in the system. So we can have a load criteria that says, now go back and pull in the exist record from the previous day as well. And what we get, again, is that temporally ordered set of events on an individual basis. So you'll get hundreds of thousands of these firing through the system that you can spread out across across your infrastructure. And it'll look kind of like this. Let's say it's a resize operation that, that happened throughout the day. Um, that line would be the end of the previous audit period. We'll get all the events in that down to the exist record. 
and then we'll also get the old verified record from the previous day. And we can pass that through a set of transformation pipelines that can look at it and do all that analysis and do those you know, verifications and things that I showed you earlier in those reports that we hard coded. Uh, we, we had a hard coded pipeline for it. Now we can do it in a plug in fashion where you can just drop in these little widgets and have it look at it and, and you know, do whatever you need for your business. We'll have a whole bunch of it out of the box uh, anyway. And at the end of it, you can generate new events. So you would store that stuff or you would uh, issue new events that would go back into the system and they would create new pipelines and they would, you know, the whole system is the snake eating its tail. Um, but it can also generate raw notifications if you want to pass those to other systems. Or you can generate samples. You want to send this out to StatsD or you want to have it so that he can look at it. Um, all that stuff can go into the system and, and Solometer can consume it and make it available to other systems. So we think that that's going to solve a lot of our problems. And in terms of the database schema, rather than generate new tables all the time whenever we want to do this stuff, we just generate new events. So since we spent all the time making the event model very rich and, and highly indexed and available, uh, we don't need to create all these tables anymore. I can just create a new, and, and these, these events can have a very, very rich payload in them, so we can put what we need in there. So that sounds great, I hope. <laughs> but we still got a lot of other stuff to do. Um, the reporting framework is another thing that we need to work on. And so we're trying to get some ideas about how to do that. We don't want to have that batch window. So at you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, we run these monster queries trying to generate all this stuff out. We want to have reports that build throughout the day the same way that the trigger pipelines work. As they're coming through, we start to build up these reports and generate little events. And then at the end of the day, we just assemble them, send it up, and say, there it is. Um, we've got to talk to all the other groups. Neutron, uh, Heat, I think, just added a, a bunch of notifications. But to, we, we need to create these trigger pipelines for these other groups as well. All that same, all, all those really fancy reports that we got out of Nova for performance tracking and all the rest of it, we want to be able to get for everything, for Cinder, for, um, you know, for, for Neutron, all those. There's a lot of knowledge in there that it's going to be interesting to look at it and see what, how we can make these correlations between all the different systems. And then working with the other groups to actually get more notification support in there. Notification support is a part of Oslo. It, it's a standard part of OpenStack. Anyone can tap into it. It's very easy to do. It's two lines of code to generate a notification. Uh, it's different than logging, so don't think of it that way. You know, think of it in terms of some state change that's really important, and I want to make sure that that makes it out, or an error occurred, or warnings happening, or you know, something really critical, as opposed to a log message, because it is structured data. So. We need to add that. More people make light work, so please, if you have any developers to spare, we'd love to get some help on it. And we think we can push this a lot farther. There's some really cool stuff that the business groups are thinking about that we'd love to, to get in there as well. How do we do zombie and orphan detection against the instances? Uh, IPv4 management is a real pain in the butt. You know, everyone's running out of IP addresses. How do we get better, faster response on, on uh, IP addresses and allocating those? Capacity planning, right? The finance department's going to be screaming, when do, we, when do we order the new servers? When do we fire up a rack? Um, so we think that those events are going to give us the tools to get to that place. And, and again, since it's in Solometer, these are all things that can be consumed by other systems already. This is not like this is a silo that we're building where we want to have everything in one place. It's just a distribution system. We take stuff in, we do some transformations, and then we make it available for other people. Solometer has a very rich API on it. We're making it even better. So you'll be able to consume this stuff outside. And, and something like Atom Hopper, I think, will work really well on this as well. So we can take these events and make them available through RSS feeds and all, you know, other, um, other mechanisms for downstream stuff. So if you want to help out. <laughs> There's a wiki page, it'll tell you all about it, like where we hang out and where we are on IRC and how to get involved and how to make contributions. That's a great place to start. Uh, but if you have any questions or anything, you can just catch any of us and, uh, and ask us and, and we'll be happy to help. Uh, that's the QR code for the slides if, if, you, uh, if you want all that, so. Questions? Is that faster? <laughs> Love Elasticsearch, and this was one of the things that came out of this week, was we've been flip-flopping on almost on a weekly basis between MySQL and Mongo, uh, or Cassandra, or whatever. 
And I think the way it's looking now is that we're probably going to do a lot of this uh, base storage in one of those two systems and then just put Elasticsearch on it for all the other stuff. So that's the, one of the takeaway experiments that we're going to have. Yeah. Oh, one more. Here we go. For Horizon notifications? Uh, I never thought about it, but uh, notifications are good. Um, so I don't, I don't see why not. I mean, I think the more, we, and we've got routing systems in most of the services anyway, so if someone doesn't want to collect those, they can just turn it off. So yeah, it'd be interesting to get some use cases around it um, to find out. It might be really good actually for usability testing as well, right? Oh. Good, yeah, yeah. Yeah, usability, so the question was, you know, would, would events be useful inside of Horizon? And yeah, I think there's, uh, the, the A-B testing side of it and usability stuff could be pretty neat to find out what people are doing, especially, or to find out who the active tenants are and that sort of stuff. That, that could be neat, yeah. So, so is, is the question that um, on the on the AMQP side yeah. that it it could be fragile? We we run a durable queue ourselves, um, uh, and then we have the secondary system. We we run to two queues. So um, so Yagi can grab the event first, and then we can have the other one. It still doesn't help with catastrophic fa failure, but it is clustered. It is durable. So, uh, but I. I'd love to get more ideas on that, because that, yeah. Andy, you mentioned having multiple pipelines and you know, mechanisms to keep them consistent. What's the, what's the secret sauce there around in, you know, having this kind of horizontal scale, but also ensuring that related events all go to the same pipeline if you notice any mixing or? Yeah, or for, uh, for the uh, latest pipelines, the And, and there might be things we can do to make that better. If we find that that's a bottleneck, then yeah. maybe we'll make that a plug-in system that we can use other mechanisms for it. So, but that's the plan right now, yeah. There are blueprints and stuff up on, on that pipeline trigger manager stuff, so feedback is always good. Even if you're not a developer, it'd be nice you know, to read it and try and give some feedback and think about your use cases and will that apply to you and, and to your group, so that could be useful. More questions? Well, thank you.